Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Post Pro Res. I am John Pollock, reunited with the one and only W.H. Park, who is with us. How are you, W.H.? I'm good, John. I trying to remember the last time we did a show together. Was it was it in July or August? Um, based on my past recordings that I was going through on Zoom, I believe it was August the 15th that we last uh, did the show together. So uh, years ago in in wrestling terminology. Yeah, it's like, you know, 15 years have passed in, in the wrestling world, the equivalent of the amount of events, especially in New Japan, since they're running like, you know, the equivalent of like, I don't know how many years in like one month's time, especially at Corkin. It's funny. They've got approximately 30 shows to go this year. So on average, that means they're going to get about, uh, you know, at the, in those three shows, they may, they may, they may draw about 10,000 people then. Well, we're, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on New Japan because this is the first time that WH and I have had a chance to uh, share our thoughts on the G1. I definitely want to get uh, WH's impressions of this year's tournament, but actually off the top, um, you know, as somebody that I know was a longtime follower of ROH and was getting all of the tapes, um, just some of your thoughts about this news that ROH is going on hiatus and just uh, from like a curiosity standpoint, like this is at the very least, this is going to be an enormous change to the ring of honor that people had been accustomed to over the last decade of uh, much more removed from the early days of it, but just where you see ROH right now at this, it feels like a crossroads in its history. I I'm under the impression that this just like PR on their part in terms of like, without saying that they're, they're done, they're done. Like, like recently I just saw on Twitter, like, you know, I think Brian Alvarez from the wrestling observer, was putting out there that the tape library is up for sale. So to me, that means that they're done. And I feel a little, you know, mixed feelings about it because like I loved ROH when it first started. Like I was getting, I got, I got VHS tapes, John's of like the first four shows, five shows. That's how far back I go. And like, I was buying every DVD um, up until I'd say, you know, the, the time they went on to like um, what is access TV or, you know, oh, HDNet. But by the time they went to HDNet, right. I, I stopped, but I was, I was pretty much getting every, show i still have all my dvds i have a complete run of roh dvds from like the beginning to like up to whenever seth rollins or tyler black became the roh champion and so i don't know that has any value or not but i i don't think i'm going to be getting rid of those anytime soon i think i'm going to keep those um but like i love that company but to me that company stopped being the roh i loved you know by the time the the sale went in through to sinclair and it, it just kind of slowly morphed into being the super indie that that I, you know, discovered a lot of my favorite wrestlers through to being just this company that existed to create content. And and I think really when like by the time like Cody and like the the elite got in there and they're and they're and they're changing it, it it, it stopped being like a source of like American wrestling for me. Like at that point, I think also like NXT was like becoming really good and like all my favorite wrestlers from ROH were now in we're now in NXT. So I was like, oh, I'm right. gonna watch NXT now. So I feel I feel bad for the people who have jobs there, but and and I'm and I'm really, you know, like happy that they were able to be taken care of during the pandemic because ROH handled that better than anyone else in in the wrestling business of taking care of their their contractor wrestlers and their employees. And kudos to them for that. But apparently that might have like Fit them in the ass now and because it sounds like they're sh- shutting down business um all i'm gonna say as far as like what with the tape library i really hope it goes to like tony khan i really hope for the sake of AEW, they they get the tape library because i think they would use it better than the wwe would i i said this the other night that i just don't know how much appetite there is for wwe to be going after tape libraries now that they have They've licensed out their network. It's not about growing the network and accumulating these tape libraries. So there is certainly a value in that tape library. But I think to your point, I think it means more to an AEW if they are looking at the prospect of eventually getting a a streaming service. I would also throw out um, Anthem as a place that, I mean, they they still run the fight network and getting a tape library like that, they I'm sure would see some value in that as well. But 
th- those are the ones that come to mind of like who would be um, of most interest. And I m- maybe years ago you would have thought it's a layup for WWE to want that, and I'm not so sure anymore. I, I think if if they want to go for it, they will do it just to spite Tony Khan. Because that's a, it's a lot, that seems like a lot of their business practices in relation to AW have seen. We're just going to spite them. So I can see them like putting a bid in, at, le- at the very least to drive up the price, just to spite Tony Khan. Just to tie it into to everything here, how would you assess the, the overall relationship with Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling, which does not seem to show any more signs of of a relationship by, by this point, but that was one that lasted many, many years. And I think people will look at the high point being that Madison square garden show, but that was also kind of like the last hurrah as well. When you, when you look at ring of honor and what they went through after all of the talent that had left, they, they sold that show out pretty much on the fumes of that talent that had left and, and with new Japan talent being front and center on that show. That, that show is probably the death knell of ROH if you want to look back in hindsight. And it was definitely the death knell of their relationship with New Japan because the the sentiment of if you if you want to use like the Girls of Destiny reaction and backstage of that show as like the indicator overall of the relationship between New Japan and Ring of Honor, it, it seems like, well, okay, New Japan does not want to do anything with Ring of Honor anymore. They had already started their plans for like what became New Japan Strong. And the, the the you know the, the New Japan USA, so it, it always seemed like New Japan was going to go a direction of like we're going to do our own U.S. shows. We're not really going to need a U.S. partner so much. And if they were going to still be affiliated with Ring of Honor, it might have been just for pure like you know like we're going to borrow some of your talent, but we're not actually going to have a direct relationship with you anymore. And it, it's it's a shame in some respects, John, because like I think they you know definitely I think. Ring of Honor in the United States bringing in the top names of like Naito and Tanahashi and Nakamura at the time really benefited like their shows that they did the, the where were they the War of the World WH, shows. We, we can now say that Hiroshi Tanahashi, Kazuchika Okada, Shinsuke Nakamura, they can all check the Ted Reeve Arena off their bucket list of venues to work. That's right. That's right. And, and I don't know if they ever worked those during the garbage strike. That, that, that we had in no no the, the garbage strike definitely predated La- lance storm and chris hero can uh can take credit for working during that garbage strike show but but not the new japan talent the great garbage strike of 2009 as i recall yeah but you know but here's the thing kazuchika okada can also check off st john's hall that's yeah. right. That is right. And that is not what, what too many. Uh, well, you know what? There is quite a few Japanese performers, including Jushin Liger and Ultimo Dragon that can uh, check that off. But that that is where when when it comes to uh, Okada being um, on the on the Observer Hall of Fame ballot this year. Don't don't forget the St. John's Hall years. OK, which <laughs> which you and me may be the only qualified people to be able to fully break down. Well, John, you, I, I was sitting in the audience. You were sitting at the timekeeper's table. So we had two different perspectives of being at, at St. John's Hall, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I had to make sure he, uh, he hit his cue. Um, so anyway, we will, uh, I'm sure, be continuing to discuss the, uh, the, the future of Ring of Honor as they go on to this hiatus. But I do want to uh, dive into the G1 because I've not got to speak with you about uh, any of it at this point. And I guess we can um, maybe start with, with the final and, and move backwards. This was uh, an unprecedented finish to a G1 final where Kota Ibushi went to execute a Phoenix splash and ended up with a, a dislocated shoulder. He's going to be out of action for two months and this was a pretty surreal scene, WH, and one where um, this was the match was waved off. There was no protesting from Abushi, and I thought like you had to give a lot of credit to the way uh, Red Shoes handled this, to the way Okada had to kind of just be the quarterback there in the ring as this is all unfolding, and as well on commentary where they were just having to pretty much call this uh, in real time and and deal with this completely unforeseen ending to the tournament yeah I, I mean i watched it after the fact i didn't watch it live i think i would have had a much different reaction but knowing that what was going to happen um you know maybe would have changed like how i reacted but i was just watching it and then seeing the point where like I, I i don't i think maybe he he hurt himself when he did the tumble outside like abushi got drop kicked to the outside and he landed on the apron and then this this phoenix splash gone wrong really like you know just made it 
just was over, I mean, put it over the edge. But you're right. I think Red Shoes really just checked him and he said, oh, he's done. Call the match, call the match. And from that, you would assume that Okada was going to win the, the tournament anyway. So it didn't really affect the booking that much. But I, I think Kota Ibushi was protesting a bit. It seemed like he did not want to, to the match to end that way. And it really took like Okada coming over and just telling him, it's okay, don't, you're, we can do this another time. And I thought that was really great of him because, you know, like some people might have, other wrestlers in, in the same situation, there's a good possibility that some of them just sort of pouted and being upset. Oh, you ruined my moment. This, this, I was going to win the G1. I was going to have a big celebration. I was going to win in a spectacular way. But Okada was just like, it's okay. We'll have another match down line. And I think he's smart enough also to realize like this is a built in rematch that might draw some money. And so, you know, he looks at it from that point. But I thought also genuine concern for his coworker for this guy that like he, he was he was down and he was down for a long time like it it's certainly and especially it being Kota Abushi where we have seen what this guy has uh, some of the things he has worked through uh, and dealt with I mean it, it looked like a very concerning scene I mean a, a dislocated shoulder is a dislocated shoulder but you know two months of a timetable it's obviously you know it's it timing wise I mean this this it works out well that he can be back for their major period in January. And it's not anything more, more severe than what it was, but also the fact that this is not five, 10 minutes into the match. This is 25 deep. And they're just about to go into, you know, the incredible closing stretch that they probably had laid out. So just think of what the adrenaline level is going as well for an Okada that all of a sudden, this is just totally the rug is pulled out. And I thought he handed it, handled it very professionally. Definitely, definitely. I, 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 I just feel bad for Kota Ibushi. He's had a terrible year, just an absolute terrible year. And, and it's like you know, like I hope he doesn't rush coming back. I hope he just like I know he probably will, but hope New Japan just says you take the time you need. Like they don't need him for these three Wrestle Kingdom shows. And, and I, I say this because I don't think they're going to be that successful with him on them or not, John, you know, like, I just think new Japan is in a state right now where, where they, they would need to pull some really big, you know, like rabbits out of the hat to make any of those shows successful. Yeah. But I, I certainly believe that he will feel that pressure to be back in time for those. And, uh, and you look at the fact that, that here's someone that was going to headline a Tokyo Dome show and could not do it. And I would hope that there is, is that level of understanding of the health of the performer first and not worrying about this guy being able to headline a, a stadium level show for us. And if you're new Japan as well, like you kind of want to have your whole, like it, it can't just be touch and go. You've got to pretty much by, you know, coming up right now, you've kind of got to be able to book these cards and start promoting them. Yeah, I, I mean they don't—they're not going to have Naito. They may or may not have Ibushi, and so they have to look at like what what do we have right now, and then just cross their fingers that nothing else goes wrong with, with anyone on the roster. Yeah, it's it, it certainly led to a lot of um, a lot of question marks for these shows. That I mean, the fact is that you are running three Wrestle Kingdom branded shows, and the big story coming out of the G One is Okada resurrecting the old. IWGP title and we now have three people laying claim to the IWGP championship with Will Ospreay and Shingo Takagi in that mix and that looks to be the A storyline going into these Wrestle Kingdom nights. Yeah, I mean I I I'll take that belt over the stupid briefcase any day of the week, John. I <laughs> but again, it muddies the waters. It's like okay, you got you got Takagi with the he's the official champion, so he's got the official belt. You got Will Ospreay with his replica uh, running around the United States and, and the United Kingdom. And, you know, like I have no interest in anything he's doing right now, to be quite honest with you. It, it just has n- no interest for me. And then Okada is actually the most interesting because I would rather they do a story where he's going to bring that title back and he's going to say the world heavyweight title, it doesn't mean anything. I'm going to win that belt and I'm going to seal it and I'm bringing this this baby back. And also, I think he doesn't care about the IC belt, but by default, maybe they're going to bring back the IC belt. Oh, okay. 
bring back the the intercontinental championship well um this is a company that's never been shy about its uh its volume of championship belts <laughs> or sealing them remember when they had like the nwf and noki's old nwf belt and then they like i think who won that thing i think it was like nakamura he's like yeah i'm sealing it I, it's it's done we're getting rid of it <laughs> Maybe maybe Brock Lesnar is going to lay claim to the IWGP title and, and want to come back. There you go. That's that's exactly what New Japan needs. They need the 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 best for business Brock Lesnar that that like kidnapped their title and they had to do the whole thing where they had to get Kurt Angle to win it and then lose it to to who was it to Tanahashi? Was it Nagata? Nagata, someone. It was like they had to get they had to get. Who's the only person Brock Lesnar will maybe drop this title to? Oh, you, uh, Kurt Angle. Let's give him a lot of money to Brock, win the Brock, belt. You've had that title for a little bit. Are you, are you coming back? Nope. <laughs> nope. He's not coming back. So they need to get they need to get another way. It, it, it was amazing given given the time period too that everyone thinks okay, well it's Brock Lesnar. He's going to be hard to deal with. It's like Brock Lesnar had very little leverage in 2005. It is not like this is Brock Lesnar of 2012. Um, this is pre UFC. This is pre K one Brock Lesnar. He is on the outs with WWE and new Japan is kind of his only way of, of making any money at the, at this point in time. But I mean, he was not shy about um, things were going to be his way. Yeah. And uh, well, he had the leverage of holding the actual physical belt, which he kept. <laughs> so that, they needed that. That is true. Yes. So. One day we've got to do a show on the, uh, the Brock Lesnar, new Japan years. <laughs> Oh that oh yeah that I I was getting the tapes of that stuff John I was like oh my god Brock Lesnar's the champion and then it's like oh god Brock Lesnar's still the champion if people remember when he he first went to New Japan that is when he unveiled the the infamous tattoo of the sword on his chest uh which he later described was how he felt when he was in this legal battle with the WWE that they had a, a knife to his throat that's how he felt well I, I I don't have a, a witty comeback for for that. I'm, I'm do, sure do there's remember, something. Do you remember what he called his finish for that first New Japan show? No, I forgot, John. This is right after he had the whole legal fight where the, he was trying to get out of that ten year no compete. So his finisher was going to be called the verdict. <laughs> oh, that's right. It was called the verdict. Great days, great days. Just burying everyone he faced, and 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 the the, the other best part was Brad Ringings hanging out at ringside, just cackling. Like like a madman, it was it was great stuff, John. Well, some other great stuff on that G1 final was the return of one Katsuyori Shibata, completely uh, a complete secret that they they held here and came out unannounced for a five minute grappling match with Zack Saber Jr. Um, we'll talk about what this means for Shibata short and long term, but just in terms of seeing him and doing this five minute exhibition. Uh, how did you think he looked? And I would imagine this was not a surprise by the time you got to watch it. No, uh, it was when I saw it on Twitter, I was like, what? Oh my God, I gotta, gotta watch this thing. And, and uh, when I actually did watch it, I was just like, I felt really great. I, th- I think he looked great. I mean, like, obviously he trains with those guys in the dojo and he's grappling with them all the time. So it's like, he doesn't have any ring rust as far as that goes, but I think, you know, and he, he looked so confident. Like he didn't look like he was nervous to be in the ring. Cause I also, he's in there with Zack Sabre Jr. If there's anyone who's you can trust to, to not like screw up and hurt you is probably Zack Sabre Jr. Especially if you're doing like a, a grappling match where there's no striking or anything like that. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like I, I think I've always maintained that part of the reason I think he went to the United States was partly was for the dojo, but also to like explore um, treatments for his, his brain injury and to like, you know, have kind of like a, the Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan come back. Um, and, and just explore options as far as what's a, like maybe what's available in Japan isn't as um, advanced or as extensive as what's in the United States. So that's maybe he finally got the treatment. And he's you know he, he's keeping it a secret, and then not from New Japan, but to the public at large. And maybe he's gonna make that you know Brian Daniels and Daniel Bryan comeback. That that I think he's he's been wanting to he's been wanting to do obviously but he's been exploring with treatments and then we'll see i think if if anything's going to happen it's not going to happen until till next year yeah i 
Like, certainly you can see, like, this was the extent of New Japan, of their comfort level of putting Shibata into a situation where this could be very controlled with a safe opponent, with a style that is not going to result in any head trauma. It's not completely risk-free, but this is going to be uh, much higher up there. I, I still, I, I have a hard time envisioning this guy having a, a full-on return to be doing anything approximating uh, a high-level match that... I think people are clamoring for, but I mean, this was just such a traumatic brain injury that he sustained. And I can't even say I would be all that um, upset at just him doing like this kind of like grappling style that I think there's an audience for it. God knows we could see some variety here where um, as like way throughout the idea of him taking one of the championships and making it kind of his own division that you have a, plethora of guys that can work this style that I think that might be the compromise that new Japan is comfortable with than him going full out in, in a match where I I think you'd have a lot of concern parties of this guy just with, with the shackles off of what this guy would do in a match. No, I, I, I don't want him to risk his health for my enjoyment. You know, I, I, he never wrestles again. I'm fine with that because like, if it means he's potentially going to kill himself, no, I don't want to see that. I I never want to see anyone die in the ring again. That's not something I... I, I, I don't I, ever I, want to see one of these fucking headbutts ever again. And no. Yet, and, I, I see one on every major show. And now you have like show his trademark now is the unprotected chair shots. Like it boggles my mind that in a company that has experienced this, this trauma uh, firsthand only f- five years ago. And it, you still see this stuff on shows. It blows my mind. I uh, yeah I mean it does to me but it, at the same time it doesn't because wrestling is going to be wrestling and you know I I I, I don't support it at all like I you, you don't need shoot head buds you don't need unprotected chair shots in wrestling in 2021 no one cares about that stuff no one needs the quote unquote realism of that shit and yeah I mean I again b- the big point being like if if he just did you know grappling matches exhibition grappling matches yeah give him the king of pro wrestling title and that make it actually a king of pro wrestling title like you can actually make that that phrase mean something if he held it and he just did grappling match, like five ten minute matches with like brown system british style who knows like something along those lines sure i'd be totally down for that shabbat and jonathan gresham there you go there you go. Well, he's free, so uh, you know potentially. So maybe he's gonna he's gonna join up with. Uh, maybe they're gonna bring. Maybe New Japan should buy the Pure Wrestling title. Um. Yeah. Maybe. Like that. That really is like the the concept that you would want for for a Shibata in in this kind of a style. And I think people would take to it um really really effectively. Like it's kind of this this mi- this middle ground to reach with utilizing a Shibata and doing it in a, in a, in a controlled way. But this was certainly the feel good moment of the G1 final and completely out of left, left field. So it was, you know, a very small number uh, aware of this going in. And I guess now we will see, like in theory, if you were going to do a follow-up um, you need a lot of attractions for January 4th, for January 5th and January 8th. It's, it's still crazy to me that they're, they're going to do three of these. I mean, I mean, it, it just keeps in line with their, their business practices for the last year and a half, I think. So, like, you know, when they announced it, John, like these three shows, I didn't, I wasn't shocked. I was just like laughing. I was just like, of course, of course, you're going to run three, like, you know, two at the Tokyo Dome, one at the Yokohama Budokan. Sure. It's a great idea. You don't, you don't, you guys don't learn anything from like your d- diminishing return attendances at, 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 at your shows this year. So go ahead. 2022, it's going to be better. Like, I will say this in, in, in fairness to them, they must be anticipating that full capacity crowds are going to return and maybe the, 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 you know, like people don't, it's not going to be clap crowds anymore because like I was reading the report you sent to me from, from Brandon Thurston and, and it's like, you know, according to like the, the figures, 70% of Japan is vaccinated. So yeah, the vaccination be- rate has just gone, th- gone through the roof over the last few months. So that, that is a very encouraging sign. I think by the time January rolls around, like, you know, you can probably see the Japanese government saying, it's all good. Like maybe, I don't know about full capacity, maybe close to full capacity, but if they lift up, you know, the, the clapping, the, the, the no saying anything and lift mass restrictions, maybe you'll, you, you can get better atmospheres at these shows. And the other thing is, is like, 
you know, there's there's no buzz, John, about these shows because of you know TV aside, he's draconian edict. No one shall gif our shows. <laughs> there are intellectual property. On one hand, I get it, but on the other hand, it's like, do you have to like just scare away everyone who wants to help promote and create buzz for your fledgling product in 2021? It, it, it's just you know, what's the phrase again, John? Cut your nose off to spite your own face. It's it's to me, it's a real disconnect between you and your audience where the, the idea that you're going to have GIFs circulating that is going to threaten someone's uh, relationship with your streaming service, that this is somehow a comparable viewing experience. Like these are free commercials for your product that you need to have or else you're out of sight, out of mind. And that that was the general feeling, I think, for for most this year with the G1, that there was there was very little buzz attached to it. And I'm not saying, you know, the their their Twitter policy was uh, commanding all of that, but it was a portion. Like, I think that there are people that are just it more so, I think, just gave this kind of idea of I'm not even going to bother. Uh, f- following along with this. And I think people were kind of turned off by that kind of a practice. And it's it's just a disconnect with the, the fan of 2021 and that you want this stuff circulating uh, to be creating that, that word of mouth. And word of mouth was definitely down this year. Oh, yeah. I mean, I should reveal, like, my, my interest in New Japan as a whole, like, is, is, is very low. I'm at the ebb. <laughs> You know, I'm at the high tide. How, how much interest. G1 did? How much G1 did you follow? Were you okay. just like cherry picking? I I tapped out after day seven, John. I I watched day seven. And I just said, I'm I don't care. Like this is I'd rather there are other things I'd rather do. There's other wrestling I'd rather watch. There's other things I'd rather do with my time than watch this product. That you know, like maybe two two of the matches on each show like were okay, but nothing necessarily blowing my mind away and after like day seven i just said i'll watch the finals see what happens there and you know and a a part of it is also like i'm not catching it live because of the time difference and then i see all these and even trying to avoid spoilers it's it's almost impossible for me then i i see the results it's like eh, okay and then was that that because of john cena is john cena now i can't blame john Cena. i think he was watching the g1 either (laughs) so I can't blame him for that. No, it's just I, I after day seven, I just said, what, what's happening in this company that that excites me in the future? Like three Wrestle Kingdoms. I'm not excited about that. I, I think it's going to be I'm, I'm here for the jokes, you know, with that. I'm not interested in, in like what they're going to put on because I don't think they're going to put on anything that's going to catch my interest to, to where I'm going to invest the time. Was there the was there any significance to the date they decided to throw the finals on on this Thursday? Because that to me was just I didn't understand that that line of thinking at all for 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 a company that I mean just for maximum attention to be putting your finals on on a Thursday morning for you know for your North American audience, which there's enough of a concern about like when you're looking at this New Japan World number. I just thought like it was just such a bizarre like middle of the week and you're just cutting off so many people that might even want to check in for the big final. I I don't know unless it was like a national holiday in Japan on the Wednesday. That could be it, but I can't remember what the national holidays are anymore in Japan. Um, It's it's, maybe it's also they they couldn't get the date for Budokan in around that time outside of the Thursday or, or the Wednesday. You know, and so they just was said, okay, that's our date. I think also there is a kind of arrogance that Bushi Road has about, you know, running this many shows that they probably didn't think about it. And anyone with any sense, I would imagine Ghetto still has some sense of like, yeah, this is what we should do. And then Bushi Road just probably overrides him and just says, no, this is actually what we're going to do. You have to, here are the dates, you fill them out, okay, with, with things that are going to draw money. And it's a tough, it's a tough business. For him to do that, and you know, I don't think the, the the task is helped by having Dick Togo as his quote unquote assistant, like trying to throw in all his crazy ideas that no one cares about. Yeah, and for for those curious, the two nights at Budokan Hall, so the B Block final drew two thousand eighty eight, and the finals three thousand eight hundred and sixty one. So you had around six thousand people between both nights of Budokan with the right. restrictions. There you go. I mean. 
I, if I was in Japan, John, like, you know, I was fully vaccinated. Would I go to these shows? Probably not. You know, I would probably think I'm going to go see something else in this venue that's probably going to be run by Bush Road. I, I'm talking about stardom. If they said we're going to have a stardom show, I'd rather go watch that because that's a consistently booked product that I enjoy. And I think, you know, like if you look at the the business end of both New Japan and stardom, in, in, you take like a kind of a median, like average of, of, of profits. Like I think it plays out that stardom has a lot more buzz to it and a lot more interest from fans in, in general than New Japan does right now. Yeah. And uh, WH mentioned the financials that Brandon Thurston was able to sip through here for New Japan that they reported their, their new fiscal year ends in June. So for the period from August of last year to June of this year, uh, they were only able to generate $60,000 U.S. in net income. Uh, now, the way the Bushi Road reports this is that New Japan is lumped into its sports division along with stardom that makes up 14% of Bushi Road's overall business. And the revenue that, of that sports division was approximately $40 million for the year. So we can't get specific breakdowns of what New Japan grossed, but... Uh, net income of sixty thousand dollars. I mean, th- this is something where, like, this is an extremely lean, you know, profit and loss margin that New Japan was running on over this past year. I mean, if you compare it to like some 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 other companies, like I think Noah is doing is doing pretty well in in the same circumstances as New Japan, but they have, you know, a, a hotter product, so more people are interested and more people are coming to their shows. And I, they obviously they're not running as many shows as new Japan, but that's, I think that's to their benefit because it makes their shows feel special. And so people are willing to save up the money and then spend the money to go. And we're going to have this big show. This event's going to happen. The end of the N one was really successful for them. And then the, the title match between Marafuji and Nakajima was successful for them. And, you know, like I also look at the, the recent all Japan show headline, the 49th anniversary show at Oda Ward. That was, that was a very successful show for all japan pro wrestling and it's like not, nothing new japan does outside of like these g1 numbers but like i'm thinking how much money did they invest for both nights at budokan like did they how much profit did they actually make yeah and i mean that's th- those are the questions we don't know of even even at a, at a discounted rate like what was it you know, renting the Tokyo Dome back in July and some of these larger venues that they have been running. Like, it seems to be a strategy of we can't fill uh, to full capacity. So we are going to run bigger buildings and we're going to just run as many shows as possible. And for 2021, um, they're going to run 174 events. That includes New Japan Strong, uh, but their median attendance is down to just under 700, which to compare two years ago was at 1,700. You know what numbers I would like to see, John? Their merchandise numbers. I want to see what kind of money they're making at the merchandise stands for these shows, because that's obviously a huge part of their business. If, if, I, if I go back to like when I was attending shows, like the merchandise lines at Corken Hall, at, at Sumo Hall, at Osaka Joe were massive. Like, or like even local shows that happened in, in Numazu on a smaller scale, like the merchandise lines, intermission, always massive lines to get to, to, for people just to spend money on the towels, the t-shirts, the, the, the clear file folders, you know, like the, the most trivial things that you can, you could possibly manage in that, that you can't even imagine at, at like a WWE or AEW show they have in Japan. It's, and it's great, but it's, it's great for them because they make so much money off like everything at that merch table. And like, I wonder if like, if they're still doing good business on that front. I would be curious the stardom numbers as well. Like maybe not the same level of merchandise revenue as, as other companies, but per head, I imagine it's through the roof for those stardom shows when you have just seen like the lines those women get after the show. Oh yeah. For, I mean, that, they're not doing the, the, the Polaroids right. anymore, right. but I, I do think, you know, what happens is like they have the plexiglass and then they have, you know, the, the talent, the stardom talent, like, you know, selling directly to the fans is like, Oh, Hey, come buy my t-shirt over here. It's like, you know, you can like pay money and they'll give give you their t-shirt. You know, that's, that's maybe a philosophy that they still adopt. I don't know because last time I went to a stardom show was with you and way and Martin and, and, and his wife, Lisa over at, at Shiva 
for spring. And that's before like Bushi Road really, really took over, like running the business and making it like kind of elevating it to some degree. Uh, just finishing off here on, on New Japan, they do a power struggle coming up a week from Saturday and the top matches for this. This is where they are now expanding uh, the numbers on these shows in terms of number of matches. Uh, but the top ones have Shingo Takagi and Zack Sabre Jr. for the IWGP title in a rematch from the G1 where Zack submitted to Takagi. Kazuchika Okada against Tamatonga for the IWGP World Heavyweight Right to Challenge in Tokyo Dome contract, as it is listed. Hiroshi Tanahashi and Kenta for the U.S. Uh, title. Robbie Eagles and Desperado for the junior title. The one that WH, he would be attending for this one. Tori Yano and Great Okan for the KOPW championship. It will either be an amateur wrestling match or a kiss my feet match based on the Twitter poll. And then we'll also have a never open weight six man match with Goto, Ishii and Yoshihashi, depending against the aptly named House of Torture. Uh, those mm. are your top matches. Plus we have... Uh, three matches underneath that. So uh, nine matches on this card as they expand them. Uh, anything that jumps out at you on that card, WH? I mean, the main event, mm-hmm. you know, Takagi versus Zach. I'll watch that, you know, at some point. Um, other than that, I, no, nothing. Like, I don't find the undercard interesting. I think it's a shame that they're wasting the Great Ocon like this. He had, like, you know, day seven, the last day I watched, had the match with him and Zach Sabre Jr., which I loved. I love that match, John. I thought it was just like, okay, this is a guy that can do different things. He can have this character, but he can also have a compelling wrestling match with somebody with Zack Sabre Jr. And it's not all, it wasn't all Zack. It was, he, he kept up with them and that was amazing. And I just thought you, you guys want to, you want to create a star, push this guy, but why do you have him do have like any, I think he, from what I was able to glean, he had a pretty decent showing in the G1. Then why do you, sticking with this bullshit of like either an amateur wrestling match, which is not going to be serious at all. Like Toyano's not going to treat it, even though he has a legit background, he's not going to treat it like that. And no one's going to vote for that. John, let's be honest. They're all going to vote for the kiss my foot match stipulation. Who, who the fuck is booking this shit? Seriously. Whose fucking idea is this? I, I want to know, is this a Dick Togo idea? Cause it smells like a Dick Togo idea. And, and I like, it, it just boggles my mind. Why would you stick this garbage? on your product, which, which is driving fans away. Yeah. To me, like, listen, I've, I've typically enjoyed like the Toriano kind of sidebar stuff throughout the G1. To me, it was like, we've, I've heard the punchline enough times like this year, the G1, it just, it really didn't click with me all that much. Um, I will ask you though, when it comes to Zack Sabre Jr., I think he was a lot of people's performer of the G1 is he at his ceiling in New Japan? Is there room for him to go higher than where he is? Or do you see him in this sort of, you know, he'll be a competitive challenger, but he is he is never going to ascend to that higher level? I like to think he, he can ascend. Um, I like to think that if they're going to put Will Ospreay in the spot that they put him in, that they will look at Zack Sabre Jr., who has a lot more uh, mental and emotional maturity and doesn't run away from you know like and i'm not i'm not slagging off osprey if he has legitimate emotional issues he should take care of them his his mental and emotional health is more important but he has proven himself to be incredibly unreliable i don't know if new japan wants to keep him around when his contract is up but you look at zach saber jr he stuck it out through the whole pandemic he stayed in japan like i think he he legitimately enjoys being there um and he he had some of the best performances of this g1 and like he, i think the ceiling is he's perfectly suited for the new japan style like he's something like old school fans will look at his wrestling style like that's a strong style wrestler whereas like osprey is more of like you know a great performer and high, daring and high risk taking person but he's not necessarily the mold of your classic new japan guy whereas saber is is straddles like the you know like the the Inoki generation and also like kind of like this new generation as well and and i just think he would be a better fit in like uh being the leader of a group i think also he needs to leave suzuki gun i think that's such a stale position for him and he needs to branch on his own like i i would give osprey spot to him and i think if new japan's really wanting to like try to capture the Western imagination, like with, with a Western star, go 
with Zack Sabre Jr. And, and, and just kind of like, you know, try to deal with Osprey in the way, any way you can, that, that's palpable to you. But yeah, I, I, I hope it's not his ceiling, John. I, I think he can, I think he would make a really good champion. And I think he would draw a lot of Western interest back to New Japan. Yeah, and I, I am curious like how he was figured into everything because the the observer had reported that this power struggle card was not going to be Zach. It was going to be a bushi with uh with Shingo Takagi. And you know, Zach had that win over Shingo, which would have put him into that whole title picture after power struggle and presumably sometime in January. So I'm very curious where Zach when all the dust settles, where he is, because I think it was undeniable to see like the performance he had how strongly he was booked in the g1 and and all of the factors that um are going for a zach saber jr that they 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 need fresh blood in in that main event scene it's not just looking at you know the the existing crew that is there that can have their their great matches but there needs to be some freshness in 2022 and i think zach definitely represents that I think, you know, him and Jeff Cobb both are like the, the people they need to elevate to, to bring freshness to the product. And this is the other thing I wanted to, to point out, like when I'm watching this, John, it's like, I look at this roster and, and it's so stale on top. Like I have no interest in any, anyone on top, to be honest with you, because it's like, I've seen it before, like maybe Okada, cause he hasn't been the champion for a while maybe but at the same time once he gets that belt and it's back to okada being okada again like i'll probably like oh okay i've seen this before but if you have zach saber jr then you have jeff cobb like who is like the closest thing to like a monster you know foreign wrestler since since vader that that's that's exciting to watch in in the japan ring i i'm hoping they look at him and it's like saying and think okay we gotta 2022 this guy has to be a big fixture like i can see him winning the new japan cup next year actually yeah yeah that would be a great spot uh for Cobb. uh completely agree with that let's talk about the guy who even with all the g1 stuff going on and what we have discussed maybe the uh mr october move over reggie jackson katsuhiko nakajima he wins the n1 with i thought one of the best matches of the year with keno and then goes on and he beats now Michi Marufuji for the GHC title. This was not the path I was looking at this N1 uh, ending up with, uh, with, with Nakajima uh, winning uh, for the second consecutive year. Uh, first of all, the, the final uh, with Keno. This, this thing was unbelievable. Yeah, I thought it was okay. I, I oh, liked it. Oh, man, I like, look at I, that. No, I liked it. You know, I, I like the Funaki match more. <laughs> I like the semifinals more with him. Um I, I've seen it, you know, like John, like I, I don't, I don't. I, lo- I love that match. I no, just fair those two were fantastic together. Keno just, just doesn't do it for me, to be honest with you. Like it's I the hair, isn't it? You hate the hair. Dude, it's this guy's obsession with wearing red. Maybe Masaki is going to shave his head next year too. He's going to go through all oh, Congo. He's awesome. going to shave them all. And they're all going to get resurrections with their, the, the loss of hair will, will get, breathe new life into their careers. You, you would think like, you know, one of the big things about Nakajima's like recent like surge to the top over the last, I don't know, like say two years was like, he got that perm, <laughs> he grew a goatee and he just started smiling more. And I'm like, that's all it took. And kicking the shit out of everyone. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was always doing that. He, was he, doing always that had the, he always had the kicks, but he didn't have the perm. He didn't have the perm and it, it got this, this edge over. And then he, he, he did the turn on Shizaki and, and it just, it just started clicking. It's, it's fantastic. And then you, you yeah. have always, you have always been super high on Nakajima. So as the year is winding down and they seem to have a pretty like solidified champion in Nakajima, um, what has that done for your interest in Noah and your prospects for them as the year closes out? Yeah, I, I'm way more excited about Noah. Like, I still think there's like a lot of garbage on their on their shows. Like a lot of these, you know, like this is idea. what this is the trade off. Okay, you get Nakajima and his perm, uh, but you also get uh, Nasawa Rangai on the under. Yeah, and his stupid fucking like leggings. Where the f- what the fuck is he wearing? I I don't get it. Someone said, oh, he's going for a Raven look, and I was like, Raven would never wear leopard print fucking leggings. Okay, don't ever like. You know, I'm not a huge Raven fan, but like, I'm pretty sure he would never wear that shit. But yeah, I get Nosawa Rangai and fucking Kendo Cashin. Uh, but I, I get, you know, Sugiera. I get like, 
you know, Mara Fuji, let's just say that match also where, you know, Nakajima won the belt. Mara Fuji was fucking awesome in that match. When he needs to be, he's a, a world-class wrestler still. And it's not always, I think his motivation can go up and down, but when he needs to be, holy shit, John, he was fucking awesome in that match. The man's 42 now. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta be selective when you, when you go all out and he's and been he's, doing, he's been, he's been wrestling like a madman for 20 plus years. Like, you know, if you think back to like all the crazy shit he did when he was a junior heavyweight, unbelievable that he's like, that he's still able to go to some degree. It's unreal. Like Marafuji, <laughs> my hat's off to that man. Definitely. But yeah, Noah as a whole, like I, I am definitely interested in like the top end of Noah, like the GHC heavyweight title, because you have all these built in storylines. You have the return of Go Shizaki at some point. And to me, that's where you lead into like is the the match between those two and has to be for the GHC title, I think. And I think there's a lot of legs on this version of Nakajima being champion. The last time he was champion, he was like still the cherub face kid essentially wearing these really weird looking baggy pants. And then, you know, this version of Nakajima is so much more interesting and him being finally, this version of him being finally being the champion is, is, is makes Noah like probably the most interesting company in Japan for me outside of stardom. So they also did the latest presentation of Kaito Kiyomiya and Keiji Muto, your, your MVP for 2021 and this was not Kiyomiya's win. It was instead they went to a 30-minute draw. Uh, is this elusive win for Kiyomiya coming, WH? Listen, even if he f- fucking beats Mudo, which, you know, is up in the air, it's not going to be a decisive win. Let's just be, let's just be honest. Nosa Ranga is not going to have Keiji Mudo lose in a decisive way that makes his opponent look better than him that's never going to happen as long as nosara rangai is booking this fucking company and and so even if kiyomiya gets the win it's going to be a a banana slipping on the banana peel win that's what it's going to be john it's going to be mudo made a small mistake and he's going to get rolled up he's not even going to get hit his fucking finisher on him he's just gonna he's gonna roll him up and then he's gonna be and then Nudo's going to kick out a 3.1 and that and that's it. And, you know, Oh, Kiwi got his win. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, like I hate saying this. I, I, I used to love Keiji Mudo so much. And, and to think of him being like the new Kevin Nash and Scott Hall of 2021 is like, it's kind of depressing to think about. Uh, All Japan had their anniversary card at Oda Ward gymnasium drawing uh, 1,242. So that, that's a very good outing for them at Oda Ward. Uh, and this was highlighted uh, but the match she told me about immediately uh, between Jake Lee and Kento Miyahara, which I sat down that night and I watched this thing from start to finish. Um, it was a, it was a terrific match. Um, you uh, were very very high here on on Jake Lee. I, I thought I thought the two they just had a great performance, and this was one. It did not feel like an hour watching it. No, with with me, I just felt that like Jake Lee finally coalesced everything he's been trying to do since he formed the total eclipse stable he turned full full on heel and it just everything clicked in this match as far as his his character work goes and like the the presentation of his ring style as well now and but but also like ken omiyahara selling the arm was oh, he was amazing unbelievable i was yeah. talking to like um rich fan of the torch and we were talking about this and i said like if i ran a wrestling school i would say i would say you have everyone has to watch this match if you want to learn want to learn how to sell a body part watch this match like you can have your comebacks but he and he did but then he went to selling that arm right away and it was it was unbelievable see he like he he did everything in his power to make jake lee look like like a, a main event guy and i think like to me, like the only the only strike against that match is that I think Jake should have won. I think he should have pinned Miyahara or made him submit. But I can see why they want to hold that off until they have, you know, full capacity crowds and they want to try to sell this match again as the main event of like a bigger show. Yeah, I mean this uh, th- this really kind of had that that sort of um, so, so, sort of the booking we we've seen with uh, with, with Utami and, and Shuri as well. Kind of that same kind of thinking where I think it's you know entice people with the match that's going to bring them back for the bigger blow off. But yeah, the selling of Miyahara was phenomenal in this. Yeah. You had Jake Lee kicking out of the shutdown German. Um, 
you know, it was it was a, a tremendous match to go out of your way uh, to check out. And I think that like, all Japan, it's like a, it's a really captivating main event scene they've got going on. And now they're getting set for their real world tag league, which starts November 13th. And this is going to be four blocks with four teams per block. Dude, there's 32 people in this. <laughs> there's, uh, there's at least one block that you don't need to see any of the fucking matches in John, you know, like I can't remember which one it is. Might, might've been the, the D block. It, it, it's, you know, this is uh, the D block has Zeus and uh, Irie, Takeo Mori and Yuko Miyamoto, Ryuki Honda and Koji Iwamoto and Koji Doi and Kuma Arashi. Might, might. Okay. That one's sort of okay. There's, there's one where it's like, which one has fucking Drew Parker and fucking Abdullah Kobayashi as a team in it. Oh, that's the A block. Uh, is Suwama and, Suwama's in that, right? With with uh, Ashino? Yeah, Suwama, Suwama and Ashino and uh, Jake Lee and uh, Hokuto Omori and Jun Saito and Rei Saito. You know, those two are brothers. They're twins, John. But one one's starting to morph into like looking like fucking John Tenta. And then one's like morphing to look like fucking uh, Giant Baba. It's, it's really weird to see like the progression of these two guys with their body types. It's weird, but fascinating still. Um, no... I, I have to look, but like, there's one block you can just fucking skip. I, I like the team of Suwama and Ashino. They're really fun to watch, John. Like, they're called. They're also called Runaway Suplex. How fucking cool is that? That that's a great t- tag team name as well. Yeah, you've got. Um, I'm just looking here through the through the rest here. Yeah, the 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 C block is a little um, missable. You can certainly, uh, you know, it's it's Shuji Ishikawa and friends uh, making up the C block. Oh uh, yeah, C block is shit. Yeah, C block yeah, that, is shit. That's probably the oh. one you're thinking about. By the way, so we should also mention that Zeus has left All Japan as that's a contract right. wrestler, and he's restarting Osaka Pro Wrestling, which I think is is really interesting news because because that that promotion's never fully gone away, but it's never fully had any buzz to it. I no, think no promotion say, ever fully goes away in Japan. No, this, this is true. This is true. There's and always an to... anniversary show to get to, and and resurrecting a company such as Osaka Pro, it is back. I used to watch back in 2000 when I first lived in Japan. I lived in Osaka. I, I would go to some Osaka Pro shows in in the area of Osaka called Shin Imamiya. And let me just say, back then, and even maybe still now, it's not a place you want to be after midnight. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, there's there's some runaway suplexes at that hour of the night. There's some runaway something out there, like where I'm like, nah, I should have got that last train. God damn it! Now I got to take a cab. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're just going to skip over WH's favorite tag league of the year, which is the world tag league that will be commencing in a, in a couple of weeks, which is dude, it's, it's going to be pretty bare bones. Like Jeff Cobb's back here in the U S uh, Okada's coming over here for the San Jose show. Uh, you're not going to have, I think any of like the real big names in it. It's just to me going to be a cluster of teams. It's going to be gorillas of destiny going wild. Is that what you're telling me, John? That's so enticing for me. <laughs> That's what we've got. Uh, we, we also have the best of the super juniors with no one, but the new Japan juniors. That's, that's incredibly exciting as well. <laughs> you're, you're always high on the best of the super juniors, but uh, is this one that it is pretty Who's much gonna be in it? To be... Who's good. Like, unless they are able to strike a deal with like fucking dragon gate or something, <laughs> who are they going to put in it? That's going to be, if, make it interesting. It's just going to be all the new Japan juniors who like, like that division has been booked terribly this year. It's so boring because, like, it's so dependent. Like, best super is so dependent it's, it's, on like it's Robbie the Eagles, Hiromu, and Desperado. That's that's your three, and and this year probably show will have you know um, more more of a spotlight in it. That like that's that's essentially the division. But but if we go back to past, you know, BOSJs, it's like which which you know foreign talent did they get in there which outsiders did they get in that that's going to complement the, the the junior okay. division as, this, it, this as of, it is this of all years for the g it's like listen you can't get talent in from overseas i understand it but this was the year of all years to be creative to throw the format out the window and what can we do to entice things and i mean we saw none of it with the g1 and i'm not holding my breath for these tournaments coming up nope Nope. And we're going to see continuing decline of their business. Like, you know, I, you know, I have someone who, who works in Japan, John in for, for, for one of the companies, I can't say who I'll tell you off air, but this person goes in my DMS and just, you know, screenshots 
you know, New Japan's like uh attendance figures to me especially at cork and hall and then we'll compare it to another company like a smaller company and look like look it, they're doing worse than fucking this company and then they shouldn't be and i'm looking at okay road to power struggle day one uh you know october 24th five five hundred ninety eight people day two let me just load it up here day two 290 people john 290 That's- people at cork and hall and, and and day day three a little bit better at 363 but if i look at okay you know what i looked up john real japan strong style pro wrestling volume 13 first tiger mask 40th anniversary third 703 people what the fuck how oh, is was, that doing it was there's volume no, 13 it was lucky I, volume 13 there, there there's no oh, there's no one on the show like that should be drawing seven over 500 people like they did seven hundred three, they they did better than than two days of New Japan. It's it's it's, it's burnout. Wh, you said it right there. Like night one, night two, night three. Yeah, like three nights in a row at Core Q and Hall. It's like it's just it's almost the idea that we will run three shows with the hope of drawing a cumulative a number number that would be a regular number in the history in in past iterations for one night. I and I think you would have a hard time drawing a consistent number of people even in like like say 2017 especially if what you're presenting is like a lot of multi-man tag matches only like you have to have some kind of draw for people to plunk down the amount of money that they're hoping to get from people i i can't see like corican giving them any kind of breaks because like everyone runs corican i don't think they're giving anyone breaks anymore now nowadays like they gotta be places like, gotta like they got to make their money too. It's like, I, I don't think they're going to be charities either. Like just handing their buildings over. You know, if like, if there's, if New Japan says, oh, we're not going to run as much. Okay. Like who wants to run pro rest, You know, zero one will fucking still go to fucking Cork and hall and, and like Dragon Gate's always there. And it's, and they're doing probably pretty well compared to, to New Japan, but they don't run as often in Cork and hall. And it's, you just, it's, it's, it's amazing that they're like kind of, you know, running, running fans away from their biggest market, which is Tokyo. Um, what's going on in the world of stardom? How much are you keeping up with uh, WH? The goddesses of stardom tag league is running through November 14th and all roads lead to December 29th, which is going to be one of their biggest shows in history with the Utami Shuri rematch. To well, thank- close up the- thankfully there's not that much already happened so i can catch up this weekend as my my plan is to watch dune on imax finally okay and then and then and then catch up with with stardom but yeah i'm excited like i i think the most exciting match coming up at the end of the year is utami versus shiri shiri has like just been my favorite wrestler this year that's i gotta say that put that out there that like i i've loved every major match she has had this year she, the, the the way she wrestles and she has just gone from being kind of like this this second or third person in donna del mundo after julia to becoming i think the centerpiece of that of that of that group and and being a centerpiece for stardom as well and it's amazing that you have this person who was who's not a star born you know stardom true born she wasn't in their dojo system she came from smash wrestling and from the indies she joined you know with donna del mundo and then they saw something in her it's like she had that awesome match with utami back in the summer and then they said we're running with her and she has knocked out of the park both in singles and in tag team and i think if they're smart they're gonna put the belt on her and just have like an amazing title reign with her for her on top there's so many built-in storylines you can do like you have how's keep coming back and she's like saying i don't like all these outsiders you know running roughshod over all the people who were trained in the stardom dojo you can have her build up to getting a title shot against shuri if that happens and then rematch with Utami and somebody like Mayu is in there tom nakano is they have such an exciting roster john and it's like they're always elevating people that's what i love about stardom right now they're always elevating people they're not just resting on their laurels they're saying you know what we see potential in micah we're gonna push the shit out of micah we see potential in like um saya kamitani okay we're gonna push the shit out of her 
in 2022. And it's exciting as a fan. That's what I want to see. I want to see stardom and dragon gate to me are just head and shoulders above everyone. When it comes to that mentality of it's not, this takes five years to make a star. It's like, listen, if we are dead set on making someone, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it immediately because we can see the audience is going to be receptive and they want, they constantly want to see new, fresh matches, new stars. Like they just, they get into that, that Ascension story. It's, 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 it's the proof is in the pudding. And I wish like New Japan, you know, the Bushi Road side of New Japan would like go over and it's like, you know, it works over here. We should do that in New Japan because that would actually help business. I truly believe that if they started pushing people, Zach, Jeff Cobb, Great Okan, like whoever else, like just fresh faces. That's why, you know, like I liked Shingo becoming a champion because it was fresh. He was a fresh face in that title scene. Uh one final topic here before we uh, get out of here, WH, but uh, shortly the, uh, the ballots will be going out for the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame. And I wanted to throw out the, uh, the Japanese candidates and you can just do yes, no, you can expand on your answer, but I w- just wanted to go through. These were the, at least, uh, we, I don't have this year's ballot, but from last year, I don't know if there will be any new names added to the Japanese side, but uh, I'm going to throw these at, at you. Okay, so yes, no. Are they Hall of Fame worthy on WH's uh, theoretical ballot, starting with Shima? Yes. The tag team. These are not individuals. The tag team of Kojima and Tenzon. No. Yoshiaki Fujiwara. Yes. Hayabusa. Which is an interesting one this year because, in theory, a lot more people are probably familiar with Hayabusa's story with the dark side treatment. I'd have to go more into like the metrics of his uh, like the how much money he made for fmw but from an influence point of view like yes from influence point of view kota bushi hmm no not right now i went yes on him last year uh but he did not get in uh kyoko in a way see i i my classic joshi is such a blind spot but from what I can gleam, yes, because like I think she, she has, she was a very, she's a very influential person in the world of Joshi. Tomohiro Ishii, no. You've got to. Uh, I was so borderline on Ishii, and I sought out Alan Forel, and I said, "Listen, I'm really, I'm really on the border with him. Prove me, prove me wrong or right." And, and he made a really, really compelling case. Uh, For yes. I did go yes. I went yes on Abushi okay. and and Ishi last year. I did not vote for Tetsuya Naito. Would you? Um, after he's close. He's close. It. I'm gonna say yes because I really think he's part of like the high points of their business. And I think because like being being in Japan, John, and going to these shows live, like just seeing. Like and his it was an eye opener, and granted, it it was January fifth, the night like the the huge night for them, but it was eye opening to see the reaction to to that title win and uh, that that audience that was so clearly there for that moment. But but just before that, just throughout the you know the since the start of Lij, the amount of merchandise like I would see penetrate outside of like wrestling events, I would go to like just walking down the street, Lij shirt. And like, like it was unbelievable, like more than anyone else in that company or any, anyone else in wrestling in Japan, like he, he penetrated, like, like there was a zeitgeist with this fucking guy. So like, I'm going to say yes for him, because I do think he drew in a lot more casual fans and, and, and sparked interest in the company. Um, I don't know if this name will still be on the Japanese side or, or move to the, the U S but Kenny Omega. I, I think probably yes, because I think, you know, like a lot of people would say like the six more based more on like AW than like. New oh, Japan. sorry. Ken- Kenny Omega got in last year. But but anyway, you can still explain your. Uh, your yeah, I think, you know, like I think, you know, AW being as successful as it was, you have to give a lot of credit to to Omega. And, you know, like I'm not a fan, but, you know, like from an objective point of view, like, sure, like you'd have to give that 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 position in the hall of fame to omega because of more of aw than than new japan new japan is a part of it but aw puts it over the top yeah and for those curious there were two that went in from this category last year with omega and jun akiyama uh but the last two here uh mako satamura yes for sure just because like she's 
she's a legend and like the matches and the business she did, but also like she's, she's a great trainer. And like, if Sendai girls had a bigger, you know, penetration in the market, like I think people would be more familiar with the names of Chihiro Hashimoto and Miko Iwata. The last one here, I think I know which way you're going. And this is a great tie in for you to, uh, to promote your, your latest release, Akira Tawe. Akira Tawe. Fuck yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, just you, you like business wise, he was part of like some huge gates, John, you know, mainly in the tag team with Kawada, but he was part of that. You know what I mean? But also, like, this guy, like, just in ring, so underrated, just so awesome. I would put him. He's if the other three go in, he has to go in. If Junaki is in, he should go in. I'm just looking here to see. Tawe last year got 39%. So you need 60 to get in. So he needs a big boost from, from people. But well, uh, Dave needs to give me a fucking ballot. Well, you know what? Uh <laughs> WH, he's at WH Park Nine. Hit him up. Man is a Japanese historian. He should he should absolutely have a ballot. So there you go. That those are the can- well, at least that was last year. I, I don't know if there'll be any new candidates to the Japanese section, uh, but that's going to bring an end to the show. Uh, WH, I think the next time you and I convene, uh, we will be near the end of uh, November. So we are, we are closely approaching the end of the year. So maybe not the next show, but um, we are going to have to do your, your WH Park annual year-end awards at some point. Okay, for sure, for sure. We'll give everyone a uh, a slice of what's out there on the long and winding Royal Road. Uh, the Akira Tawe episode uh, dropped a few weeks ago. A fantastic look. Uh, you have now covered all four pillars, and I understand there there could be more uh, construction on the long and winding Royal Road down down the road. Well, we're gonna we're gonna the next one is gonna biography episode is definitely gonna be Jun Akiyama, and I, I have a guest. So I, I'm gonna announce all that like as as the the that episode gets closer to re- like the recording for that. But, but uh, I think next week, John is, is the new episode of the long and windy yes. road road. Yes. So I'm going to uh, sneak preview the, the, the guest and, and the, the match we're going to talk about. Did you listen? Did you listen to it? Cause I sent the, the, the audio already. Oh, you've sent it. I, I have not heard the latest show. No. Okay. So you don't know who the guest is. I don't know. Okay. So we have, special guest he's he's really famous because he's won the bwe transfer window twice now oh my goodness so it's jamesy is is going to be the next guest on the long and windy row road and his match that he picked is the six-man tag match from april 20th 1991 between suruta gun jumbo suruta akira tawe masanobu fuji against the super generation army of mitsuhara masawa toshiaki kawada and Ken Kabashi in, in what many people call John, the greatest six man tag match of all time. My goodness. This, this, this would headline a Jamesy card any night of the week, even, even on a Thursday when it doesn't make sense to run a major card on a Thursday, this, so, this would sell out. So I've already recorded this and, and it's a near two hour show, Ooh. <laughs> but the biggest near, comeback of the year, Jamesy. It's a near two hours of us just going like crazy and, and being so enthusiastic about talking about this match. But in particular, we are so enthusiastic about talking about Masanobu Fuchi. And if you a have treasure. any... treasure. A treasure, John. You, you, you saw him. You got to see him live. I did. You know, you can say, I've seen that man live. And you're, you're going to understand the love we, that we, both, both James and myself have for Masanobu Fuchi. Go watch the match. We're going to have the, the link in the show description. And I'm probably tweeted out before the show drops. That's the best somewhere. way. Always, uh, I always enjoy I watch the match and then I listen to the podcast. And it's, uh, it's, it's a great way to enjoy the show. For when you watch the John, full extent. Just watch the, the, the immaculate work of Masanobu Fuchi in this match. He is the greatest asshole in the history of wrestling, maybe. It's amazing. Fantastic stuff. Well, I very much look forward to that. The long and winding Royal road dropping uh, next weekend. So check your, your local post wrestling listings uh, for all of that. But WH uh, thank you as always. It's great to catch up. We will not have such a long gap before you and I reconvene uh, because we need to, we need to put the whole industry in check uh, by, by getting your opinions. That's right. And and we, we need to go get some coffee sometime soon too. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Now that the G1 is over. My, my life is uh, a lot easier, so we are definitely going to grab some coffee. I've got, I've got to see Mr. Uh, Mike Murray as well. It's, it's been too long. Mm, yeah, I think, oh. I think uh, he, would, he would enjoy that as well. 
Okay. Well, Mike, if you're listening to this, uh, I'm coming by soon. So look out. You might want to send him a text too. Uh, I'll, I'll probably do that. I, I've learned not to communicate through podcasts, but that is it for us, everybody. Thank you for listening to Post Pro Res. Give the man a follow at WH Park, the number nine. If you're nice, he might mute you. If you're a dick, he'll block you. That's it for us. Oh, I don't I don't block people necessarily, John. If you block me, I'll block you in retaliation. But usually I like I like people screaming into the ether at me and I'm not aware of it. I, it just makes me feel so satisfied. That is the more enjoyable way to go about Twitter life. But that is it for us, everybody. Goodbye.